Hey everybody, Chaotic Meatball here, and welcome back to another Pokemon challenge. Specifically, another Professor Oak's challenge. I actually recorded this one a while back, and I figured it's finally time to put it up. Anyway, let's get right into the rules with this. Number one, you can must have the highest amount of Pokemon owned as possible in your decks with the least amount of badges obtained. You can fight trainers in the gym ahead of time, even the leader itself, but when getting the badge, you must have that Pokedex completion as high as possible by that point. If multiple badges are available, then go ahead and get the one that allows you to catch the most Pokemon in the next section. Number two, single game only. This means that we're not allowed to trade or get any trade evolutions or other species like version exclusives nor use any of the event or mystery gift features. Lastly, no glitches or exploits to get extra Pokemon, though exploits to reduce the amount of time spent on the challenge is allowed. Also, there's a few sub rules that I'd like to add onto this one since normally I go for the fastest one, but these prevent some insane measures from having to take place. There are no soft resetting for rare candies, since in Ruby and Sapphire, each Zigzagoon has a 1% chance to pick up a rare candy after every battle won, and that's at any level, so we don't have to grind up a pickup squad. The ideal play here would be to save, do a battle, hope to get 2-3 to three candies, and reset if you fail, save if you succeed, rinse and repeat until you have the entirety of literally Willy Wonka's factory of chocolate in your bag. I'd rather this still be with a bit more integrity, so I'm admitting this. Number two, no soft resetting for Pokemon, other than Feebas. You'll hear why, unless you've already watched the Emerald Professor Oak challenge, in which case you already know. Lastly, planting berries is not allowed. Otherwise, the ideal strat would be to plant a bunch of Lepa berries, wait a day, harvest, and repeat until you have all of them, and can skip just going back to heal. Also, huge shoutouts to the Reddit user Fire1520 for the guide I'm using for this challenge. And with all of that out of the way, let's get into it. I name myself Chaotic, and while we're riding in the back of a moving truck, let me tell you about today's sponsor, me. Yes, me is here to tell you that only one out of four people that watch this channel are subscribed, and that you should like and subscribe for more videos like this, especially since I'm... I'm gonna be doing the Heart Gold Soul Silver Professor Oaks challenge soon. Yeah! The intro is pretty standard since we don't have Pokeballs yet. Though, if you have a dead battery in your game, make sure to set your game to between 3.59 to 8.59 AM or PM, since this will be important in a few sections. After picking up Mudkip and taking out May on Route 103, I received the Pokedex, surely ready to begin the challenge. I ran through Route 102 and the tutorial before going to catch anything, moving over to Route 104 to grab Wormpole, Wingle, and six Zigzagoons, one for evolving and the other five for pickup. I made sure to grab all six of them and moved back over to Route 102 so that I could grind and use the pickup ability to get rare candies, eventually catching the rare encounters of the route, those being Seadot or Lotat and Sapphire, Ralts, Poochiana, and Surskit, which is a 1% encounter on the second round of the game, before moving on to Petalburg Woods. There's a few things in here to capture after the trainers, those being Silcoon, Shroomish, Cascoon, and two Slackoth before moving on to the northern part of Route 104 and Rustboro City. Now, I catch Silcoon and Cascoon because I don't want to have to deal with getting four Wormpole in a row that evolve into Silcoon or Cascoon. I'd rather just have the two and switch train them. It's much faster that way. I arrived in Rustboro City, but I skipped over it for the time being, leaving just Route 116 for encounters. Those I caught were Ninkata, Talo, Wismer, and Skitty. And since my Zigzagoon is close to evolving, I just grinded in the Rustdrift's tunnel, evolving into Linoon at level 20. Afterwards, I went back to Rustboro and traded my second Slackoth that I grabbed in the Petalburg Woods for a Makahita, adding yet another to our total. I went ahead and brought it over to Rust Turf Tunnel to grind on, and that's where the bane of my existence in this section reared its ugly head. Disobedience, except this time I have to go a whole 13 whole levels with disobedience. But after a bit of painstaking grinding, luck, and filling each slot with an attacking move, Makita evolved into Hariyama at level 24. Next up are the Cocoons, which I switch trained with Mudkip. Mudkip can KO stuff really easily and has a lot of PP and defense, so after a short amount of time, Silcoon evolved into Beautifly at level 10, as did Cascoon evolved into Dustox at the same level. 
Next up is for training with CDOD, who's very frustrating because it only has the attack Bide. Now, it does get nature power at level 13, but it turns into Shadow Ball in caves, though for it's useless against the normal type of Wismer. So, it's quite a bit of a pain unless you switch train it. So, after two trips of it, biding, healing, and just switch training in general, CDOT evolved into Nuzleaf at level 14. We don't have a Leaf Stone yet, so we'll be waiting on Shift Tree. Next up is Poochiana, who's really not bad at all since it's very strong and has Tackle and Howl, which you can use together to get one hit KOs, and it gets Bite at level 13 for that same type of attack bonus. I needed two trips to finish off the grinding for it, but at level 18, Poochiana evolved into Mightyena. Taylo is up next, and it has quite a few attacking moves, and with a few PP ups that I got from Pickup, I managed to finish the grind in one go. I also noticed that using one of the King's Rocks that I picked up from the Zigzagoons was great because at first, I could flinch the Whismers rather than taking more damage, which saves a few seconds of time since I don't have to sit through Taylo's health depleting and healing in the menu. After about 45 minutes, Taylo evolved into Swallow at level 22. Last one before we assess our rare candy situation is Shroomish, which took three trips due to it not having as much PP until later on in training, and Absorb and Tackle are pretty weak to start off with. It's not too bad though, since Effect Spore can go off if the Wismer decides to use Pound, but it doesn't really affect the training all that much unless you get a few poisons here and there, and they really don't save that much time. And with that, Shroomish evolved into Brainloom at level 23. From here, I pulled my strategy straight from Fire 1520's guide. I grabbed Wingle first and trained it to level 22 for optimal experience gain, as Wingle has plenty of moves for it to get to level 22 in two trips. Three rare candies later, and Wingle evolved into Pelipper at level 25. Next up is Ninkato, which I got to level 18 in two trips, since it has pretty weak moves like Scratch, which doesn't get Stab, and Leech Life, which isn't too powerful and therefore not very useful to do enough damage. After getting to level 18, though, I went back to the Pokemon Center. This gives me an optimal time to save when using the rare candies since I can just deposit a Zigzagoon and evolve into Ninjaska level 20, depositing the additional Shedinja from the evolution split. Fortunately, you don't have to have a regular Pokeball in this game either. Any Pokeball will actually suffice. Next up is Surskit, and oh boy. This one isn't as bad as C Dot, but it sure is irritating because you actually have attacking moves but it's incompetent and can't really damage anything without going down. It legitimately cannot one-shot anything during the grind, so you're usually two-shotting in the late levels, three or four-shotting in the earlier levels, leading to a quite a few Pokemon Center trips. I got pretty fed up with it by the end, and I was glad that I was done with it at level 19, since three rare candies later, Surskit evolved into Masquerine. Now it's time for the last four, which are all level 30 or old revolutions. There's a chart included on Fire's Guide, which I'll put on screen for what level your Pokemon should be based on, how many rare candies you have. And I had a pretty good amount at first, but I highly recommend starting with two training trips for each Pokemon so that you have an accurate number of rare candies to work with, since by that point you'll have done eight training sessions addition to what you already have in your reserves. After going through said grind with all four of them, I came out with Mudkip evolving into Marshtomp at level 16, and a level 20 before using 16 out of 71 rare candies to evolve into Swampert at level 36. Yeah, that's how frequently you can pick these up. It's actually ridiculous. Next up is Wismer, which is actually pretty rough to train inside of the Rest Earth Tunnel, due to the fact that the species has soundproof therefore nullifying Uproar's damage, and since they're normal type, Astonish doesn't work either, so it's best just to train on Route 116 for that PP usage, and train inside with the Pound PP and any other moves you happen to get later on. I got Wismer to level 20, evolving into Loudred, and with another 20 rare candies later, Loudred evolved into Exploud at level 40. Second to last is Slack Off, which is actually relatively easy thanks to the proteins I picked up throughout the section, one-shotting pretty much instantly so therefore I didn't have to deal with the stupid Truant ability and basically waste my time. However, it evolved into Vigoroth at level 18, and 18 more rare candies led it to evolve into Slacking at level 36. I still had 22 rare candies left, so I just grabbed Ralts, trained it to level 9, and evolved it into Curly at level 20 and into Gardevoir at level 30 with rare candies. It's probably a waste of some rare candies, but at this rate, I don't know if it will be a waste since I got an additional two rare candies during that small grind just with Ralts. 
and with a total of 37 Pokemon in a time of 16 hours and 2 minutes, I took out Roxanne and it's time for the next section. After taking out the Magma Grunt in the tunnel that I spent the last 14 hours in, I got the letter and rescued Pico so I can go ahead and travel over to Doofer Town. First things first though, it's fishing time. I grabbed the old rod and here in Doofer Town I made sure to capture a Magikarp, which was a level 9 rather than the level 7 that I had caught on the last attempt, and Tentacle. I made sure not to enter the Pokemon Center here, since it'll actually be important here soon. During my first pass through Granite Cave, I captured Mawile, Aron, and Abra. After those, I gave Steven the letter and used an escape rope, grabbing Geodude on the way back, and teleported back over to Rustboro to grab the EXP ship from the Devon Corporation. Uh, no. You're not trapped if you use teleport. Mr. Briny is back on Route 104 to uh, basically prevent a softlock from happening. I gave Tentacool the EXP share and grabbed the Sylph Scarf from Doofurb for later. I took out the Gym Trainers to get Tentacool some EXP, and now it's time to head to Slateport. Boy, I love being able to just straight up skip Gym Leaders and go on to do other things. I skipped out on the Trainers on the beach of Route 109 for now, and went straight to Slateport's Market so that I can grab 10 Zinc and 10 Protein. This is specifically for Crobat since we'll need to get the friendship of Zubat, which we caught in the Granite Cave, up relatively quickly. We want Golbat to evolve into Crobat at level 23, which is the level straight after Zubat evolves into Golbat, which is also helped by the Soothe Bell, which we can get here in Slateport in the fan club. Afterwards, I took the EXP share from Tentacool and switched it out for Zubat, giving it the Soothe Bell. From there, I just gave it the vitamins that I had just purchased to get the happiness up as much as possible, before fighting off the Magma Grunts in the museum. I made sure to grab the TM for Thief while I'm here, since I'm going to need it for later. Last thing before heading to Route 110, I grabbed the Pokeblock case, since we'll need that for a much later section for a certain pain of an evolution. I'm going for the daycare as fast as possible, actually, since it's very broken in this game, but I managed to encounter Oddish, Gulpin, and Minin before fighting May, taking her down while switch training Zubat with the EXP share. Doing this is great because you get 75% of the EXP on the Pokemon you're training, rather than the regular 50% that you'd be doing with regular Switch training without the EXP share, making it quite useful for not wasting EXP on your main beat sticks that you send out to get through the battles of the game. After the battle, I got the Item Finder and caught an Electrike, and after about another 10 minutes, the 2% encounter in the form of Plusle. I am very happy that wasn't as hard as it was in my Alpha Sapphire POC, because I remember those horde battles and not liking them at all. And with those captures, I'm able to head into Mauville City, since there's a few things I have to do here. So I grabbed the HM for Rock Smash, as well as the Mock Bike, and I took out Wally for good measure. Now it's time to explain why the daycare is broken. We can put two Pokemon in here during all the steps in between all my other battles for everything else, which will save time since they gain one EXP point per step. And with the bike, that means you're getting a ton of steps really quickly. And it's time for a bunch of biking, because I'm literally just going to use this because it's actually faster as a rate of EXP per minute, rather than having to grind here on Route 117 against the Illamise, Roselia, etc. So I made sure to deposit Aron and Tentacool, since we actually want Aron to get to level 28 before continuing, as well as getting Zubat's friendship up enough to where it evolves as soon as possible. I made sure to fight the trainers on the route before biking, allowing Zubat to evolve into Golbat at level 22. That takes about 17 minutes of biking to get Aron from level 11 or 12 to 28, so yeah, it's much faster than grinding. This biking also helps me get the rest of the friendship I need for Golbat to evolve, but I won't be leveling it up for a little while. From here, it's literally just biking until everything is ready to evolve. First of them is ready is Tentacool, which I got up to level 29 before using one of my few rare candies to get it to level 30, evolving into Tentacool. I deposit Geodude next, biking until Aron grew to the cusp of level 32, allowing me to retrieve it and fight a wild Pokemon, evolving into Laron and depositing it once again. Here though, I figured that now's the time for the final few catches of the section. Here on Routes 117, I fished for Goldeen, then captured Roselia, both a male and female Meryl, Illamise, and after around 15 minutes, the 1% encounter Volbeat. I am surprised that these 1 and 2% encounters are not giving me as much trouble. And with that, it's time to move on to the rest of the grinding for the section. 
You see, as I said before, the average EXP I get from using the daycare is much higher than grinding on everything else. So I just kept depositing, biking, and taking them out when they're on the verge of a evolution. So after a few hours of biking and the occasional fight, I evolved Geodude into Graveler at level 25, Golbat into Crobat at level 23 with max happiness, Abra into Kadabra at level 16, Leron into Agron at level 42, Meryl into Zumaril at level 18, Goldeen into Sea King at level 33, Oddish into Gloom at level 21, Golpin into Swallowed at level 26, Electrike into Manetric at level 26, and Magikarp into Gyarados at level 20. And with a total of 67 Pokemon, and a time of 19 hours and 51 minutes, yeah, that's how fast it was, I'm able to take on Watson and claim the Dynamo Badge. After beating Watson, I grabbed a party of Linoon, Kadabra, and three Zigzagoons and moved over to Fiery Path, where I'm able to capture Slugma, Torkoal, Numel, Coughing, and Grimer. I wanted to not grab Torkoal first because of the blank slot in the party, since I'm using it to share EXP, since I was looking for the 2% Grimer, and I was bound to have to knock out quite a few Pokemon here before finding it. I teleported back and deposited Grimer and Slugma into the daycare before moving onward through optional trainers with coughing. It didn't take me too long before I got to the best route of the game, Route 113. I really do love the music here. I need to cover it once I actually have extra time on my hands. Anyway, I captured Sandshrew and Spinda before using Kadabra again for the handy dandy repel trick this time to capture a 5% Skarmory. It's why I didn't use Gardevoir as my teleporter during this part. I swapped Kadabra for a Zigzagoon while in Full Arbor Town, moving over to Route 114 where I made sure to grab the TM for Dig, as well as capture Zangoose, or Viper and Sapphire, and Swablu. Now for the reason, we brought Coughing along with us, aside from just training. In Meteor Falls, we need to use it to farm a Sunstone from the Soul Rock here. I caught the first Soul Rock I found, somehow managing it having a Sunstone on it already. So I got really lucky and didn't even need to have Coughing with Thief. If you're playing Sapphire, you'll have Lunatone here, which you'll need to grind for a Moonstone for something later on, so you may as well do it now. After finishing up the event with Team Magma, I made sure to grab a teleporter, and it's time to go all the way back to Dooford. If you watch my Alpha Sapphire or Emerald challenges, you know what time it is. Nose past time, so I made sure to grab the rare candy from the first basement floor before going after Nose Pass, using Rock Smash to find one in about 10 minutes, catching it, allowing me to escape rope and teleport back to Full Arbor. With all that taken care of, I swept through the entirety of the Team Magma event on Mount Chimney with Swampert, giving me the freedom to move down to the Jagged Pass, where I can capture a higher level Machomp, and Spoink for the final captures of the section. Lastly, I grabbed the egg from Lava Ridge, leaving just the grind, or should I say exercise. After all, I can't bike outside right now, so it's best I practice on that good old social distancing and do it in my video games. So, with a few hours of biking and the occasional battle, I was able to evolve Slugma into Macargo at level 38, Grimer into Muck, also at level 38, Why Not into Wobbuffet at level 15, Machomp into Machoke at level 28, no Machamp because no trading, Coughing into Weezing at level 35, Numel into Camera up to level 33, Gloom into Blossom with a Sunstone, Skitty into Delcaddy with a Moonstone, Sandshrew into Sandslash at level 22, Spoink into Grumpig at level 32, and Swablu into Altaria at level 35. I should mention that I did get that Moonstone from the one that's just sitting in Meteor Falls, which Sapphire also gets. And with a total of 93 Pokemon in a time of 25 hours and 31 minutes, I teleported back to Lava Ridge Town to fight Flannery and take her Heat Badge. You'd have 92 Pokemon in Ruby due to no Sunstone for Blossom. This section is actually much easier compared to the other ones, since we only have four Pokemon to grab, all of which are on Route 111. I grabbed the Go Goggles from May and ran straight over there, leaving two open party slots before leaving. Again, I just have to say that the Desert in Hoenn is quite nice, though I don't get why you need Go Goggles here, but not in Generation 5. I guess Brendan is just a wuss in comparison to Hilbert the Hero. Anyway, I captured Cacnea, Trapinch, and Baltoy in about 6 minutes, and grabbed the Root Fossil and moved back to Mauville, dropping off Cacnea and Trapinch before going all the way back to Rustboro to revive the Root Fossil into Lily. 
Lastly, I made sure to get the Firestone from the Fiery Path, since we'll need it for the next section. And we need the steps for the daycare anyway, so it's not really a waste of time. But now that we're all done with that, I did the nice old exercise routine in, in less than two hours. I evolved Cacnea into Cacturn at level 32, Trap Engine into Vibrava at level 35, and into Flygun at level 45, Lilip into Cradilly at level 40, and Baltoy into Claydol at level 36. And with a total of 102 Pokemon and a time of 28 hours and 12 minutes, it's time to take on Brawly since we can't take on Norman until we have four badges. So after destroying Brawly, we're able to take on Norman and destroy him as well. Now it's time for all the surfing. All of the water. All of it. All of the water. In fact, I am drinking water right now. <sighs> I grabbed Surf from Petalburg, and after the gym fight, I grabbed the rare candy here for later. Route 115 is just north of here, and thanks to Surf, I'm able to capture a Jigglypuff. I made sure to capture a female one before picking the Kelpsy berries and teleporting back to Mauville. I dropped off my female Jigglypuff along with my male Plusle to get an egg to spawn. But while I'm waiting on that, I decided to take Manetric out of the PC and do the new Mauville side quest, where I made sure to capture Voltorb, Magnemite, and with Repel Trick, Electrode and Magneton at level 26. And with that, I shut down the generator, grabbed the Thunderstone, and escape roped on out to get the TM for Thunderbolt that will hopefully be useful later. There's also a rare candy outside which will be useful, of course. I grabbed the egg, Flygon, and four of my pickup Pokemon, and now it's time to finally move on to some new territory. Route 118 doesn't have anything for me, but Route 119 sure does. Oh boy, yes it does. Feebas. Oh god, Feebas. I shit you not, it took me two hours to find a tile for this, which is absolutely ridiculous. Since I make sure to check every tile from bottom to top, three to four times each just so I don't accidentally skip one of them, due to them only appearing 50% of the time. I managed to find one relatively close to the bottom of the body of water on the southern part of the route, so I'm sure it would have taken even longer if it wasn't for some well-placed luck. Anyway, after that nonsense, it's about time I move over to some actual encounters. Oh, wait, Team Magma wants to get in my way. Ah, yes, my reward for taking these dumb all-earthers out is a cast form, a small ball that has a sack underneath. Uh, what the heck were the designers smoking? I get that it's supposed to be a molecule, but it sure does look like a ball sack to me. Well, anyway, I took the mystic water off of it and shoved it into the PC before taking on my rival, which was a piece of cake. Also, I made sure not to forget the leaf stone on this route, unlike my emerald POC. Grabbing a Tropius before moving into Fortree City, where there's absolutely nothing to do. Winona's badge only gets us Fly, which means we'll be leaving here until right before the Elite Four. Route 120 has some interesting things though. Firstly, a rare candy behind the cut trees at the start, as well as a Kecleon with the Devon Scope that was given to us by Steven here. Lastly, there's another hidden rare candy on the left corner across the pond, so we're getting a good amount of these for basically absolutely nothing. I made sure to also grab an Absol before moving over to Route 121, where I get to be an absolute ninja and avoid literally every trainer I can, while also triggering the Magma Grunts to go to Mount Pyre before arriving in Lily Cove City. Now it's time for my favorite minigame of all time, Berry Blending. I managed to get a serious natured Phoebus, so I only need to blend two Weepier and six Kelpsy Berries, so after withdrawing Phoebus, I made sure to grind those up at the max level and fed them all to Phoebus, and now it's time to level it up. I went back over to Route 121, evolving Phoebus into my Lodic after three trainers, and entered the Safari Zone. We're gonna need both bikes to get everything here, but since I already have the Mach Bike right now, I took care of those catches, those being Gloom, Doduo, Girafferig, Natu, and a female Pikachu in Area 2, and Rhyhorn, Pinsir, and Dodrio in Area 3. That's everything I can get with the Mach Bike, so after leaving, I evolved my Pikachu into Raichu with the Thunderstone that I grabbed in New Mauville, then withdrew Rhyhorn and gave it the XP share so that I could level it up on the trainers through both Route 121 and Mount Pyre, grabbing Shadow Ball for a grind later on, as well as the Sea Incense, which we'll be using later for breeding. Now that all the trainers are out of the way, I went up the mountain on the outside, catching Metatite, Vulpix, hatching Iglybuff, and Duskull before heading to the summit, grabbing a rare candy and a level 30 Shuppet. 
Of course, though, there's one more stupid encounter before we can move on, and that's Trimeco. It didn't take a super long time to find it, but it was a 2% encounter, and I severely dislike those, even though they've been nice to me this run. However, I managed to catch it before grabbing the Orb of Doom. Boy, it seems like every time I do something, I'm able to fit in at a completely obscure Power Rangers reference without trying. Anyway, I moved down to Route 123 to take out the trainers before making my way back to the daycare, where I grabbed the egg from our previous visit, evolved Vulpix into Ninetales with a Firestone, and Gloom into Vileplume with a Leaf Stone, then depositing Raichu in the daycare with my male Plusle, since it's still sitting here since we got Iggly buff. I rode around for a little bit, grabbed the egg, then deposited my Azumarill while holding the sea incense. I rode around again, grabbed the egg from them, and hatched the both of them, getting Pichu and Azumarill in the process. Now with that over with, I can grab a teleporter and swap bikes for the Acro since we still have a few Pokemon missing from the Safari Zone. I made sure to drop Rhyhorn and Duskull in the daycare so that the steps on my way there were counted and it doesn't waste that much time. I engaged the cutscene in Slateport, and with some forethought, I made sure that I could teleport back to Lily Cove without the need of fly. I figured now would be the best time to take out the rest of the Safari Zone encounters, so within about 15 minutes, I managed to retrieve myself a Psyduck from Area 2, specifically at level 32, a Fanpy, Zatu, and Heracross from Area 4. It didn't take too long to find them, especially when I could just stand in place and rotate without wasting steps. And with that, it's time to take on the Magma Hideout. I assembled my party and moved in, taking out everyone and grabbing the Master Ball, which will be very helpful later on with a roaming Pokemon in the after game. Now with the water routes. Basically the rest of the region is open to us, and I can catch basically everything else that isn't locked behind Waterfall in the post game. The first area of interest is Shoal Cave, where I'm able to catch a Sfeel, and since I set the time to be low tide, I am able to go lower into the cave and grab myself a Snow Run. I escaped roped out and moved over to Moss Deep so that I could grab the Super Rod, which will be needed for a few encounters as well. I made sure not to visit the Pokemon Center though for another strategic teleport. Route 128 allowed me to grab a Love Disc, a level 39 Whalmer, and a Corsola with the Super Rod, since why waste time on a level 31 with training. Meditite also evolved into Medicham at level 37, and Fan P evolved into Don Fan at level 30 on the trainers on a few of the water routes. Eventually they made me to Route 132, where I made sure to grab Horsey and Sharpedo with the Super Rod. Going with the currents of the route lands me in Slateport City, and just north back to Mauville, since you know what time it is. I grabbed the mock bike again, and it's time for another visit to Route 117. This time though, it's actually not for the daycare, I kinda duped you guys out. Instead, I grabbed a level 29 plus Corefish with the Super Rod so that I could evolve it easily into Crawdont with a rare candy. I did the same with Whalmer and Psyduck, evolving them into Whalord and Golduck respectively before grabbing the last few catches of the section. Those being Barboach on Route 110, into Whizcash with a rare candy, and Carvana at Route 119. And would you look at that, we're done with the catches for this action. I got a pretty good amount of rare candies, so I was able to easily train a few levels over on Mount Pyre, then evolve Horsey into Seedra at level 32, Sfeel into Celio and into Walrein at level 44, Snow Run into Glalie at level 42, Shuppet into Bayonet at level 37, Duskull into Dusclops at level 37, and Rhyhorn into Rhydon at level 42. And with that, we've got a maximum of... Wait a second. Oh, I forgot Star you with the Super Rod in Lily Cove City. Okay, now we have a maximum of 159 Pokemon, and the most you can have with only 6 badges in a Ruby version. Sapphire actually has one more now, at an even 160, since they get Wigglytuff, as well as getting the Blossom that they missed out on on the section that we got it. And with that, I demolish Tate and Liza and move on to the rest of the game, since the last few sections are relatively short in comparison to what we've dealt with so far. So, first things first, I taught Waylord Dive and headed to Route 124 since I need a blue and green shard. Luckily, I can find one of each on this route, so I can trade them for a Water and Leaf Stone respectively, allowing me to evolve Staryu into Starmie and Nuzleaf into Shiftry. Afterwards, I made my way to Sutopolis and grabbed myself a Clam Pearl and a Chincho underwater before arriving. This will be helpful since I'll be using this city as my teleport point for after I get the two available Regis for this action. I also left a slot empty in my party since I needed to grab a Relicanth before proceeding. 
I did so, and dealt with Team Magma, evolving my Chinchu and the Lantern at level 27 in the process. With those irritations out of the way, I can finally move towards the sealed chamber with Relicanth and Waylord as my first and last members of the party respectively, unlocking the Reggie Chambers. First up is Regirock in Route 111, who wasn't bad at all to catch, though I did need a reset since I ran out of balls somehow. The guide I was following recommended just throwing YOLO balls since there's a 0.83% capture rate at full health, but I'm willing to sacrifice a few in-game minutes to save me some IRL time. I do the same with Reg Isis Chamber on Route 105, getting in with the stupid leave the braille up on the screen for two minutes thing. Well, I guess I can plug something while we're just standing here. Follow me on Twitter, uh, just in case YouTube decides that I have become too sentient for their own well-being and try to rip down my channel. Anyway, Red Ice wasn't too bad to capture either, and I didn't even have to reset. And with that, there's only one more Pokemon to get for this section. With the rest of the story out of the way, I entered the Hall of Origin and mopped the floor with Groudon, catching it within a dozen Ultra Balls. And there we go. That's a total of 168 Pokemon for Ruby, 169 for Sapphire, and the most you can have with only 6 badges. Each section after this only adds a few more Pokemon, so I took down Wallace and moved back over to the Meteor Falls. So, because now we have access to Waterfall, the new Pokemon available here is Bagon. So I made sure to catch it at level 35 with the Repel Trick since it's in the slow EXP group, and I need to minimize the amount of time that I'm spent grinding. Luckily, I made sure to keep most of the surfing trainers available so that Biogon would have an easier time getting levels, making it easy for me to level up once and get to Shellgon. I got it to level 41, leaving me with enough rare candies to get it up to 50 and evolve into Salamence. Awesome, that didn't even take an hour. I'm quite pleased with that, and with three more added to the total, Winona's taken down, leaving just the pre-elite 4 and post-game sections. Luckily, the pre-elite 4 section is literally just Registeel which I needed to fly to access due to the dumb braille puzzle. So I grabbed it in its chamber over on Route 121. Now we can fight the Elite Four. I made sure to just grab a bunch of legendaries and Flygon and just went in there since I didn't really have anything else to fight. So yeah, I was able to smash everything up to my path to Steven. You'd think Steven would be hard, but hey, Groudon is great at destroying things. So I'm able to destroy his team. And as the credits roll, I recall one absolute pain in the neck we're coming up to. After the credits, I roll across the TV and see that Latios is available. Or Latios if you're playing Sapphire. I'm guessing that you're aware that it's a rolling legendary and that they need no introduction. Luckily, I have a great area to move back and forth from, and that's Slateport in Route 110. So I just grabbed a random Pokemon less than level 40 and started repel tricking it out, getting it in only about 15 minutes. Not bad. At least it wasn't friggin' Zapdos at the end of my X and Y Professor Oak's challenge, because that took forever. A few more things and we'll be all set here. First of all is Rayquaza. Honestly, this could be worth your Master Ball if you decide to whittle Latios or Latias down earlier, but I really can't recommend that with a good conscience, though this thing can tear you apart if you're not careful. I managed to whittle it down and got it on my third attempt at trying. Thank god, I was starting to rip my hair out in frustration thanks to this dumb thing tearing me apart. One more Pokemon to go, and that's Beldum, which is a gift Pokemon. Time to evolve it, and evolve it we shall. So I gave it the EXP share and put it at the front of my party, changing the battle style to Shift, so that I could keep swapping back and forth to Rayquaza during some Elite Four rematches, giving me Metang at level 20, and Metagross at level 45 within three passes of the league. And look at that total right there, 177 Pokemon, and the most you can catch in a single copy of Pokemon Ruby version. Of course, Sapphire is still one ahead at 178, but that's still nearly half of the national decks out of this generation. And a few more than Fire Red and Leaf Green, making them the second biggest games of the gen next to Emerald. Somehow I came out of this challenge with a time of 45 hours and 50 minutes. That's amazingly low for a Professor Oak's challenge, but it's all thanks to both 14 Flash and Fire 1520 for providing some amazing in-depth guides on exact movement and how to perform the runs at an optimal pace. I'm sure there's still more that can be done, but with the daycare strategy, it really ended up, up working out, and I'm glad it did. I'm happy with this run, and I'll be leaving the links to all of the guides that I used in the description. And I think, I think next time we do a Professor Oak challenge, we're finally going to get the Johto. See you guys next time.
Thank you guys so much for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, consider becoming a member of the channel and help support the content I create, since YouTube's ad rates have been down for everybody. Or consider supporting the Tratreon for only a dollar a month. Also, make sure to follow me on Twitter for memes and hopefully recovering my YouTube channel if it gets deleted. And I'll see you guys next week.